This is the Television Enthusiast Podcast, The Weekly Set. Episode 4, recorded February 19, 2015. Welcome to the Weekly Set, the Television Enthusiast Podcast. I am your host, Tyson. Joining me today are Will. Hello. And Kat. Hi. Okay, so today our topic is just going to be our usual basic run-up of some of the news of the week, as well as what we've been watching. Uh, next week we're going to have a more focused topic on uh, the upcoming spring schedule, but this is just going to be kind of us talking about what we've been doing this week. Um so first off, let's start on some of the news. Amazon did their pickups from their pilot season, and uh, we we watched uh, two or three of the shows. Kat, did you ever watch the um, Point of Honor? I didn't. I think the premise didn't really interest me, so I never went back to it. Okay, so that that one didn't even make it. So <laughs> not too bad. So yeah, so it, it doesn't really matter. But the other two we watched did. Some other I ones did that. as well, but you know they're. Uh, <laughs> they're kind of like outside of our uh, interest group. So, but I think the uh, the other ones I did were like a documentary series and then like two kid shows. So yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. But uh, they they did pick up Mad Dogs and Man in the High Castle. Woo! So I know I know you didn't like uh, Mad Dogs, Cat and Will. You were kind of like lukewarm on it. I think. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to see where it goes. I didn't like the beginning of it, but I really liked the twist and the way it went, and that makes me more excited about where it will go from there. So I'm excited about that, but of course I'm most excited about Man in the High Castle. It seems like all three of us are excited about that. Yeah, I think that has the most potential. Oh, yeah. This is going to be... This looks like it's going to be Amazon's third really good series. So they did Transparent, and uh, now they have Mozart in the Jungle. And it looks like, you know, Man in the High Castle is going to be their next, like, big, you know... Big thing. Well, it's <laughs> yeah. interesting to note because Man in the High Castle is actually their most watched pilot, they announced, since they started this whole pilot season program. Wow. I don't, I don't doubt it. That's yeah. cool. I mean, because Transparent and Mozart in the Jungle are both really good, but they're kind of more in that, like... You know, kind of like indie vibe, kind of, you know, like limited audience. Yeah, they're more niche audience. Yeah. Yeah. Man in the High Castle has that, like, I could see it being on, you know, FX or, I don't know about HBO, but I could definitely see it being on, like, FX or... FX or, or um, AMC. AMC, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I could totally see it fitting on there, so... Yeah, for sure. And the production values were great on that show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they really were. Fantastic production values. They just, they knocked out of the park with with that, and I'm excited that they're making more. Oh, yeah. I'm really excited about that. I love, I loved everything about that. I love the opening. Uh, (laughs) Just all of it. So good. So So how long um, until we see more episodes? Will it probably not be until next year? Yeah, Yeah, 2016 is when they're scheduled. Okay. So it's, it's going to be a wait, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least we know something on the horizon for 2016 besides, what, uh, Twin Peaks? That's the other thing we got. That's Twin true. Peaks. Oh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So, yeah, so that's those are kind of our two things to look forward to for 2016 so far. Right. Cool. Let's put on our two... 2016 preview. <laughs> In other news, and this might end up being a 2016 as well, um, Fox has picked up a series, is it a series order or just a pilot order for um, Lucifer? The article I read wasn't very clear on that. I assume it's a series order, but it just I know that they had, they had ordered a script, I think, or maybe it was the pilot. I don't know. But anyways, there's, there's something going on with, uh, uh, Lucifer at Fox, which is a, it's a spinoff of the Sandman comics. It's based on, yeah. right? It was based on uh, oh. Neil Gaiman's Sandman comics, which uh, which is like an all It's so it's like it's essentially it's another DC Comics show on TV. Okay. This will be well. You know, I know nothing about it, but you say Neil Gaiman, and I think that gives it a lot of credibility right there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely. If only it was faithful to Neil Gaiman's comics, the source material, which from the description it doesn't seem like it's going to be very faithful at all. Oh, dear. 
I remember Fox's last DC property. <laughs> the description of it has Lucifer in Los Angeles helping the cops solve crimes. Huh. In the comic, wasn't he, he opened up like a jazz club or something? Yeah, he or... opened up a jazz club, and it was basically, it was basically a big argument for, uh, you know, against God, basically. It was like, he, Lucifer was arguing for total freedom, and God had everything predestined, predetermined. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> I'm doing like a really bad job explaining this, but. No, that's just, I find that incredibly ironic. Okay. <laughs> this is nothing like that comic book from the, from the brief description they gave. I mean, because now he's fighting crime. <laughs> I don't, of, of yeah, course. that sounds like it's, a, it's a procedural. It's a deviation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's <laughs> a police procedural with Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why does everything have to be a procedural? I don't it's know. CIS Hal. Yes. I think there are more than enough of those on top. CSI, not CIS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's probably a procedural out there called CIS, right? That they're interchangeable. I mean, In- instead of playing a "Who Are You" as a theme song, it's going to be all uh, uh, <laughs> "Pleased to meet you." How do you guess my name? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> going to play "Highway to Hell." Yeah. <laughs> Um, Satan will put on sunglasses after saying a snappy one-liner and <laughs> all the crime. Oh, uh, yeah, Tyson, when you said earlier, um, look at the last DC property on Fox, are you talking about Gotham? Yeah. Okay. So you guys seem to be coming kind of more around to Gotham. I'm I'm done with Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. It's it can be pretty ridiculous at times. It it can be. I don't know. It just. Despite how ridiculous it is, it just has a certain charm to it. I agree. Like, there's there's aspects of it that I like still. Like there's there's kind of almost like a um uh very stylized look to the show that I yes, like. Yes, you know. Great. But it's just the writing. It's just I can't <laughs> I can't take it. You know, it's. <laughs> I was I was hanging in for kind of like the looks and kind of like the hope of what it would go and and. Uh, I'm actually surprised that it's a hit, like, the way it is. Because, yeah. I mean, I know, I like... I don't wonder if it's just any association with Batman usually ends up being a hit. Even though it doesn't technically have Batman, you have the Batman universe. It's one of the best-known universes. I'm sure that gives it a fair amount of mass-market appeal. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, out of all of DC's superhero properties, Batman has been the most mass-market of them all. Yeah. yeah. It's the best. Yeah. And <laughs> it is their the major ones, at least, you know, not if, not counting if you get into, didn't DC publish, um, or one of DC's companies publish like Watchmen, and so it's like there's other, you know, really good comics they have, but of their main series, of their, like, universe series. Oh, yeah. Even, uh, yeah. Batman even outsells Superman, which is supposed to be DC's premier series. Yeah, I feel like if there's one comic property out there that is just like everyone knows this character, even if they know nothing about comics, like the one figure that represents comic book heroes, it's definitely Batman. Definitely. Now, definitely. I'd, I'd say Superman used to kind of be their their flagship, and now it's more Batman. But I, I blame that on Superman's inability to translate into the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Also, also the fact that they really haven't been able to do well on the on the movie front, which is where a lot of the mainstream success comes from. Yeah. Since since the seventies, you know. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time since there was a hit Superman movie. I mean, Man of Steel did okay, but that was you know it was Even... nothing compared to the success of the Batman movies. And yeah. it did so uh, so moderately well that they decided they needed to put Batman into the next movie. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> They're like, okay, how do we make people watch Superman? Put Batman <laughs> in it. <laughs> Here's how you get people to watch Superman. Move away from the Messiah metaphor. Like, I would love that so much if they moved away from that. Oh, one. yeah, that's so tired and cliche when that comes to, like, <laughs> Superman. That's been done, like, and- a million times. 
And it makes him so completely unrelatable as a character. Right. I don't want to go watch someone who's so much larger than life that might they might as well be a god. I want to I want to watch people who are completely messed up <laughs> and are screwing everything up along the way while trying to do the right thing. I find that much more interesting. That's Wouldn't it be really interesting, interesting if they if they instead of like doing like a straight up adaptation of like kind of like the more major stories if they just did like they said like okay here's the movie we're gonna do and they just went like way off and did one of the really obscure kind of like alternate history type ones like if they did like you know the red son of krypton oh that was like a cool. movie that would be really <laughs> cool. just like out of nowhere for it i'd be for it i um, my favorite, I don't know if this, I'm not familiar with that plot line, but one of my favorite things that Smallville used to do was the Red Kryptonite stuff. Cause it was, it made Clark at his most flaws. And I thought it brought out the most interesting aspects of the character. And I really liked it that they kept going down that well. Right. I don't know a lot about the Red Sun story, but I know that it's, it's Superman basically is Russian instead of American. Huh. So he's, <laughs> so he's kind of like, you know, in the same way that, like, you think of Superman as, like, oh, he's an alien, but he represents, you know, the red, the white, and the blue, you know, and yeah, the yeah. baseball well, and now apple he's, pie. like, representing communism. And <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's actually a fun kind of twist. I like that. Yeah. So I was just thinking, like, that would be weird if they did that, because it was a really popular story, too. But it, it's, like, it's one of those kind of, like, more, you know, oh, this is interesting kind of side stories. It would be interesting to see then take something like that and make that, like, this is our movie, you know? And just, yeah. you know, no tie to anything else, no, like, this is part of a series, just straight up, this is just, like, a one-off thing, you know? Well, somebody pointed out the major difference between Marvel heroes and the DC heroes is that the DC heroes tend to be more of, like, infallible gods, you know, like <laughs> Superman, where yeah. the Marvel heroes are kind of, they're messed up. They have issues. Yeah. <laughs> so I would argue, at the same time, Batman, who is the most iconic one, is pretty messed up. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why, that's the why he's the most the, iconic one now. <laughs> the, the, the Dark Knight trilogy is that, like, how messed up do you have to be to take on the Batman persona? And is Batman really who he is? Like... You know, instead of Bruce Wayne, like I totally get what you're saying because I think Superman is a huge problem in that way. But um, that's something I really enjoyed Batman, and something I've really enjoyed about Arrow too is how immensely flawed Oliver Queen is. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, but that's that's definitely that that's like uh, that's why Batman's become like the most popular character now is oh, because okay. he's so different from all the other DC gods, you know? Okay, right. no, I get what you're saying. Right, you don't really yeah. see flaws like that with, like, The Flash or Wonder Woman or, <sighs> yeah. you know. Okay, that is so one of my issues with the Flash TV series is I find Barry Allen appealing solely because of how Grant Gustin plays him. But I swear there is not a complex bone in that kid's body. <laughs> no, there is not. <laughs> He's so boring in and of himself. I think Grant Gustin makes him work other in ways that he otherwise wouldn't. Right, right. Yeah, I, I kind of like, I, I saw that being a possibility of a problem, but I was kind of hopeful because the first episode of Flash felt so, like, Spider-Man-esque that I was like, yeah, they'll be able to kind of get into, like, his irresponsibility for being young and inexperienced, you know? Yeah. And, but they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And see, I think I talked about this, but that's exactly what I love about at least the Sam Ra Raimi Spider-Man films is the moment he gets powers, his first instinct is, how can I use these powers to impress a girl? Like, it's right. so much more a human reaction. So, yeah. And that makes him so much more relatable a person. Whereas Barry Allen is like, I must only use these powers for good. And it's like, what motivates you to be right. this much of a saint? Yeah. P Peter Parker's doesn't become a superhero until he realizes that his irresponsibility led directly to the death of somebody he was very close to. With When he realizes that he let somebody go who he could have stopped with his powers. But no, I completely agree with what you were saying, Will. Like, that's one of my favorite moments in the first Spider-Man is that he's more or less plays a big role in the death of his uncle. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, Barry Allen, it's like... 
I don't know. I don't. Has he ever made a, a legitimate mistake in his life of any notoriety? I don't know. He's a bit too one note for me. Yeah, and I I watched the last episode of Flash, not this week's yet, but the one last week. I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna transition us into that. Speaking of the Flash, so I'm up to date. Um, Kat, are, are you up to date? Yes. Okay, and Will's one episode behind, so let's try to retain spoilers from that point on. But so sure. Will's seen up to the the nuclear blast, basically. Yeah, I don't know. I had issues with that episode. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I mean, I liked the Firestorm stuff. I thought that was cool. It was cool that we got more into that character and what was going on with him. Um, but all the stuff surrounding it was just awful. The stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like everything to do with Barry and the reporter lady? Yes, that was cringe inducing. <laughs> it was the same, it was the tired old trope of, oh, we got a potential love interest, but, oh, he's gotta go off and do a superhero thing, and that's gonna ruin his relationship. <laughs> And it's, yeah. that's been done surprise, a million surprise. times. I know. Yeah. Yet Flash can't seem to find anything new to do with the whole secret identity, Barry trying to have a, relationships in relation to that. Like, everything they do is stuff that we've seen before. I right. think when it gets something gets that cliche, and this whole secret identity thing has, you know, yeah. you need to, you need to kind of take, you need to just tread lightly on that material. Because if you can't, if you don't have something radically different to do, just be very light on what right. you do, and and don't make it the focus. So yeah. it makes me wonder what is this woman doing in the story, other than being just a dumb cliche. <laughs> well, uh, I think she's there to motivate Iris to realize she has feelings for Barry, which was one of my big issues. With you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's like Iris <laughs> talking like about she's cliches. Trying to get to have a new plot line. And then they pulled her back into the Barry stuff, and I just went, oh. Yeah. I, just when you thought she was out, they pull her back in. Yeah, I did not like that either. I was like, that was so dumb to me. I was like. Yeah. I just don't buy the uh, romance between the, or possible, like, love interest between the two of them. No. It just seems kind of, like, gross. Like, in the same way that it was gross when we found out that, you know, the guy who played Dexter and Deborah, like, were dating in real life. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's that kind of like, yeah, like, they have that brother kind of sister relationship, you know? And, like, it just seems off to put them in these, like, romantic things. It just does not work, you know? To be fair, having people who are brothers and brother sister or grew up as brother sister who end up falling in love is something I've actually seen on quite a few TV series. Yeah, but sometimes <laughs> they don't they don't get it right you know sure. and and they just this this is similar to me to the whole dexter deborah thing you know and dexter which is just oh yeah, yeah which just that does was not work. cringe inducing it makes me think happened. of uh boone and shannon on lost because yeah, they grew yeah. up as brother and sister and i didn't really buy that they loved each other and it was kind of oozy and weird oh but yeah they, but they played on that in a sense on lost where they made it like that was like, it was kind of Boone's own obsession, and Shannon herself kind of saw it as a little weird. But, you know, she loved him, but more like as a brother, you know? Sure. And he kind of was more conflicted between those two feelings, but, you know, it, it's, I think they, they played with that in the right way on Lost, and that sure, they, they, I they see pointed that. out that it was a kind of gross, weird thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, getting back to the discussion earlier about Flash using the superhero tropes, I think what I find most discouraging about this, and this is also uh, something I, uh, similar to some issues I have with Arrow this season, is that I felt like going into the series, Arrow had a ton of superhero tropes, and not one of them felt redundant. Not one of them felt cliche. Right. I felt like every single one of them, they were doing really new and interesting things with them, which made the show really interesting and it's so discouraging to see both shows now falling back into superhero cliche oh yeah yeah definitely it's cliche cliche city on both shows now and it's yeah the whole storyline with laurel not telling her dad about sarah's death (laughs) what that was just so messed up on so many levels 
<laughs> yeah. It's like, why? <laughs> it was just so so oddly handled. Too, yeah, the way it's they like, handled like with her mom finding out, you know, and all. It's oh, just, everybody it was just on so the oddly handled. Planet and, like, finds they, they kept out. Having, and they kept having the scenes with like uh, uh, her father, like making some comment, like I saw her, you know, she was using her martial arts, and like <laughs> you kind of like to try to like tug on our heartstring kind of moment thing, and it was just so awkwardly handled. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, well, and the one I've really been discouraged by was um. One of my favorite scenes ever on the series was last season when, like, they had Laurel at her rock bottom and Oliver follows her out into the hole and just Hall and totally tells her off. You're I don't right. know if either of you remember that scene. Like, it's just this awesome, satisfying moment. And I was like, one of the things I loved about it is, like, you would, Smallville never would have had Clark tell off Lana Lang to that degree, even oh, no. if she was growing up. <laughs> and now I realize that... Um, that Arrow isn't bypassing the trope. They've now just slotted Felicity into that slot, and I guarantee Oliver will never, ever tell her off or put her in her place even when she is in the wrong. It's like, oh, Arrow, what happened to you? You used to right. be so much better than Because that. they're trying to make Elicity a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just awkward and weird to me, again. It is. Well, now whenever they do have Oliver tell somebody off, he's, like, completely in the wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're just, he's just, like, turns into, like, an asshat at certain points. Like, yeah. And that's it. Yeah, this you know, like, season, like, not... Oliver is just wrong, and everybody else is right now. And <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the show just really has lost its way. It's... It's really depressing to watch. <laughs> I have to say, you guys haven't seen the most recent episode. I think the most recent episode is kind of a breath of fresh air in a sense, because it, it first off, it brings back something that, that you like on the show. Well, they go back to the island. Even if it's, yeah, even if it's temporary. Uh-huh. But in addition to that, it's, it also seems to be kind of giving resolution to a lot of these kind of weird things, you know? So hopefully it's like their mid-season moment where they were like, oh, this stuff isn't working. And this was the episode where they got to kind of like write themselves out of it. Okay. So that's what I'm hoping that this was. I hope so, because I feel like every episode, they can't seem to decide who's going to be the season-long villain. They keep It's like they keep changing their minds. And they're abs- there's an, an absolute refusal to commit to a season-long story, which is mm-hmm. something that really drove both season one and season two and made them both really good. And third season seems like it's drifting along, trying to find something to do with itself. I read somewhere that the producers of Arrow said that they didn't want to have a big bad for this season. Or to have Why? A, that's always a mistake. Yeah. Why? Because I hate it when they said they, they said because that would just be repeating themselves or something. Okay, I'm sorry, but Andrew Kreisberg is like always quoting Joss Whedon, which means this guy clearly thinks well of Joss Whedon. And hey, guess what? Buffy and Angel did. They both had a big bad every single season. It's okay to keep reusing that idea just so long as you do new things with it. Right. Exactly. In fact, that's the big bad. That's the driving force of the season. You know, that's where it's exactly. heading. Exactly. Every exactly. time I've heard a show like turn that down, go like, "Yeah, we're not going to do that this season" or something like that, it's always been to the detriment of the show. <laughs> right. Like I can think of some examples. Dexter did that one time. Mm-hmm. They didn't have like a big bad. It was one of the worst seasons. The last season was the worst, but it was one of the worst seasons. Um, what was another one that did that? Was uh. Um, oh, you know, and this one did it because of, uh, um, not because it was like a creative choice, but because the show was failing and they thought it was like their only chance at finding some marketability, but Veronica Mars did that in its third season. Oh, yes! That was, and that was, that was, that was sad because you knew Rob Thomas did not want to do that. I know. Right. And but he kind of really felt like it series. was his only chance that, you know, like serialized stories were not taking off at the time. You know, Lost was, but nothing else was. And it's still too much of a risk for the network because they want people to be able to jump in anywhere. Yep. And so he, like, he tried to break it up and make, like, these little shorter stories so people could just kind of jump in at any moment and enjoy it. And it really hurt the series, it you really know. But did. But in that case, it's, you know, I don't blame him. He was, 
he had really no other choice, you know? I know. It's a, it's a miracle Veronica Mars got three seasons. Yeah. It really is. And a movie, thanks to Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Well, yeah, it's interesting because Ronic, uh, 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 Kristen Bell blew up in popularity like right after that show was canceled, like right around the time it was being canceled. You know? <laughs> right. That's kind of ironic. Yeah, and now she's like bigger than ever because she was in like Frozen, and you know. It's yeah, like... seriously. <laughs> well, she's uh, a great actor. I'm happy to see her get success. Yeah. So it's it's good, but it's. That's every single time, yeah. Every time I see somebody come out and say, you know, this season we're not going to do the big bad, or we're not going to try to have this kind of single, you know, big, you know, arc or something like that. It's like it always to the detriment of the series. It's <sighs> never come across another way. Yeah, that's such a bad idea. I really hope that they change their minds going into fourth season because I think it's made their season something of a train wreck, to be perfectly honest. If I was running a show, I'd say the same thing. I'd say, you know, we're not going to do a big bad for this season. And then I'd, like, wait a few seconds for the dread to set, and I'd say, we're going to do a big bad that lasts two seasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. That would be awesome. <laughs> well, hey, they kind of did that with Deathstroke. I love that Deathstroke took a season and a half to build up. That was yeah. really satisfying. I, I love the fact that, yeah, that they built Deathstroke up organically. Instead, just having him appear out of nowhere and be the villain. It was, yeah. that was really cool to see his relationship with Oliver Queen, how that came about, how they came to be enemies. That whole journey really made Deathstroke more important as a villain than just like, if he was just some guy who came and started causing trouble. Yeah, exactly. The fact that we got to see so much of the backstory is what made second season so enormously effective. Right. I think that's one of the like amazing things that the show did absolutely right. And that's what, one of the things that made me like absolutely believe in the show and believe in the writers because most shows wouldn't even di- go do that. Mm-hmm. And they got a great actor for the part, which just makes it all Manu the Manu Bennett, you know? like, yeah. nailed that role. Seriously. He's yeah. so uh, good at that role. I mean, and that Completely was, like, so amazing, because Deathstroke has always been one of my favorite DC Comics supervillains. He's, like, one of the greatest villains in the DC Comics lore. So they, if they are going to do him, they had to do him right. And Manu yeah. Bennett knocked it out of the park, I thought. And they totally did. And what I appreciated is, um, as I think I've said in the past, is I'm very unfamiliar with the DC Universe. So I didn't know going in that Slade Wilson was going to turn into a villain. But I still, I never felt alienated because of that. I never felt like I was being left out of the party. And I enjoyed just as much as everyone watching his slow emergence as Deathstroke. I thought it was exceptionally well handled. Right. I just knew because his name was Slade. Yeah, I, yeah. As soon as, he, as, soon as, as soon as he showed <laughs> up and said his name was villain. Slade, I said, "Yep, yeah, that's Deathstroke." Speaking of nice. which, have you guys noticed that like some of these comic book shows recently? I I don't have a, an example, unfortunately, but there have been a bunch of castings for these superhero shows where it's it'll be like a character filling a role, and the and the actor's name is so much more comic booky than like the character. <laughs> There was I one example, noticed. I think it was uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., like the last, the first half of it. One of the people, one of the new guys on that show had this, like, amazing comic book name, and that was the actor's name. <laughs> <laughs> it was so disappointing to, like, you know, read the names and go, like, oh, it's not the reverse. Oh. He has such a boring name. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah. And there was another one recently. I can't remember who it was, but there was another one where, oh, you know what it was? It wasn't a comic book show. It was, I, I saw some people and they were talking about the the upcoming uh, Man from Uncle uh, oh. uh, movie that's got, it's got the guy who played uh, um, Superman in it. Yeah, Henry Cavill. Oh, Henry Cavill. It has, yeah, it has him in it. But the other guy in it, you know, and he's been in a bunch of stuff, but it's, <laughs> he has like the greatest like comic book name, which is, you know, Army Hammer. Oh yeah, Army Hammer. <laughs> I mean, how can you beat that? <laughs> it feels 
like he could be like Captain Hammer from Doctor Horrible or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's his real name. And <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And it's sad because he was like the Lone Ranger in that movie Tanked and stuff, and it's like oh, he yeah. needs a comic book movie, and they just need to use his real name for the character. <laughs> Just make it all meta. It's him playing himself as this actor that's struggling that's actually a superhero. <laughs> that might be taking things a bit far. Actually, isn't that what Birdman is about? Um, I think Birdman's supposed to be about an actor that's struggling with his identity as a character he played. Yeah, it's exactly. It's kind of like Batman it's for not Keaton, entirely I guess. dissimilar to Batman. So, you know, yeah. there's some similarities there. Yeah. So let's let's move on from the Flash and stuff, but stick in the grounds of comic books. Um, Agent Carter. So Will got through episode four. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, there's a certain character reveal in episode four, a character that you find out something else is going on. Uh, yeah. One of the uh, girls in. Like, okay. Yeah. What... I just I didn't want to spoil that. So. <laughs> is it? Oh, can you specify? Because I don't remember which is episode four, and I don't want to spoil anything. Are you caught up, Cat? I'm all caught up on Agent Carter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I am too. Okay. Yeah. Um, episode four was the episode where Howard Stark returns, and he tasks Carter with stealing one of his gadgets from from her agency there that she okay. works for. Did he find out what that is yet? Uh, we did find out. In that episode, we find out what that is. Okay. 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 I just want to say that scene where she tells off Howard Stark after finding out what that is, is possibly my favorite scene on the series. Oh, yes. Definitely. Oh, it was a good scene. That was... She tears into him so, there... so well earned, so well executed. Haley Atwell is just beautiful in that kind of stuff. I was, uh, They're playing very well off of the whole Captain America storyline that, you know, from the first movie and, and kind of all the emotions that kind of come from that and the great chemistry that those two characters had and, and kind of bringing that back up without even having, you know, the other actor on screen. Mm-hmm. But you still feel it. You still feel that presence, you know? Yeah. It's is and uh, yeah, she's doing a great job, you know. Oh yeah, she's doing. Well, I got I got to imagine they have like a picture of him up like next to the actor who's playing Howard Stark, just so she can like draw on that emotion, <laughs> you know. Well, and I just thought also the way she tore into him was so well deserved. Like when she talks about how you're always like saying I love you to a woman while really looking at yourself in the mirror, or something like that. Like I just thought. It was a very, it was something that needed to, to, to be said to Howard Stark because he's quite the user. Oh yeah. yeah, he's he's a womanizer, just like his son is. Um, yeah. <laughs> basically, uh, that's a thing about he's Howard Stark. He's a very flawed man, just like yeah. uh, Tony Stark. Just like Tony Stark is very flawed, and. Yeah, the way she told him off, the emotion in that scene, that was just a fantastic scene, a fantastic performance from her. I mean, she is already dealing with all of this stuff that's happening to her, plus she she's still dealing with losing Steve Rogers. She still hasn't come to terms with that, and so when she sees that vial, you know, when that comes out, it all hits her like a ton of bricks, and she just lays into him. And it's great. Yeah. And I like that um, Haley Atwell just has this perfect, cool demeanor in which she plays Peggy that makes her tough. And I think it would have been really easy to oversell the emotional moments to make her seem like more traditionally feminine. I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining, but I really like that they made her emotional without feeling like they were violating the boundaries of her character. I think, I think yeah, a lot of her character, sense. I think her cool demeanor is the fact that she's trying to hold it in. You know, she's trying to be cool and you know, take things in stride and just do her job, do what she's supposed to do. But Well, and I think also she does that because cause, cause that's how she is, because right. that's what she's good at, is she's good at taking things in stride. Because right. I feel like Jarvis is the one who always loses his head, and she's the one who always stays calm. Right. Jarvis <laughs> is a terrible liar, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, you, you'll get more of that, Will. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. Oh, and and I have to say, I don't know if you'll agree with me, Cap, but like after this point, from this point on, I think like the series is just it's on all cylinders. I mean, oh, yeah. it has been from the beginning, but it's just really exciting to watch now. You know, it really there's so much happening now. And, no kidding. Well, and, and I you, thought the you get a treat agent... next episode. Well, oh really? Yeah, you get some uh, um, some MCU appearances. Oh, nice! Ooh. You saw him, Cat. Yep. <laughs> I know. I'm cheering because I'm yeah. happy for them. Yeah. Well, so and, you... and it's fun because I thought the double agent stuff was going to last the entire season, and I like that they didn't. They went, we can't rely on this too much, and maybe we can do more interesting stuff. So also that 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 uh, theory I had last week that I mentioned about a connection to Avengers and stuff. I think I, I know what you're talking about. I now. looked it up and it's been confirmed by the That's showrunners. That's so freaking cool. I I'm, want now, Will. I want you to catch up so we can talk about it because it's really freaking cool. Okay, I'll catch up for next week because I really want to talk about. Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> So yeah, so it's it's that's been confirmed. So I'm excited about that, and it's yeah, it's cool. Um, Here's what I want to know with Agent Carter is my fingers crossed. They did say for next week's episode they called it a season finale, not a series finale. I really want them to have at least one more season. Like oh, definitely. I would gladly watch. Oh, more if they do another season. Was, That'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, especially if it was her and Jarvis. I just want <laughs> the two of them, you know. They're so much fun together that I would gladly keep watching any show. Oh, yeah. They, they you know what make I saw? such a great team together, her and Jarvis. Yeah. Do you know what I saw recently that I had no idea about? Did you know that Agent Carter is the first TV show that the special effects are done by Industrial Light and Magic? Really? Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's it's awesome. the first one, and... I always knew this. The special effects on the show were great. Like even in, was it the pilot or the second episode where they had that huge implosion? I think that was you know, the second and, episode. Yeah, the shows had like great looking effects, and, uh-huh. and and the way the effects work with the the look of the show and everything. Well, it, and oh, also it's been amazing. Think, from what I can tell, they're they're used to actually um, transform modern day cities to look like 1940s. And yeah. they do a really seamless job with that. It's oh, they do. Like you can't the even tone tell. The atmosphere is perfect on the series. Oh yeah, and it and it totally has that look. Have you have you watched Captain America yet, the first one, Kat? No, I'm gonna. You should because it it looks like Agent Carter. Like that. Oh, cool. That's the way the film looks. It has the exact same like color palette. The exact same. Oh yeah, it's the exact just, same it has tone. That look. Yeah. Oh great. Yeah, I definitely want to. It's definitely on my. Uh, near future agenda. But yeah, it's it's so uh, yeah, I'm 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 excited for more of that. It's I'm I'm sad to see that there's only one episode left in that, but at the same time that's next week is gonna be the return of uh Agents, Agents of Shield, which Shield. is just starting to fire on all cylinders. And... I know, I know. I didn't think I was actually kind of sad Agents of Shield was going off the air and I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna get into Agent Carter and now I'm like yeah, I could wait for Agents of Shield. I want more of Agent Carter. <laughs> I want I want Marvel to do this every year. Give Agents of Shield a couple months hiatus and give us another season of Agent Carter. I would totally watch. Do you know what they need to do is they need to have like um like three or four different series and just have them going <laughs> all year long, you know? <laughs> <laughs> If, if just they cut could back find, and like, forth. Distinction for each series, like what makes oh, yeah. each of them different. That could be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's what they that that would be awesome. There'd always be something on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That could be an interesting experiment. So let's see. Uh, um, besides those things, we got a uh, um. So Will hasn't watched it, but uh, Parks and Rec. We we mentioned a little bit before we started the show, but. Man, it's been so good the last I couple know, episodes. I know. They've just packing in the references, packing in the returning and guest appearances. What I love about this is um it makes me so glad that the show decided to end on its own terms and it totally demonstrates all the advantages of it. Because so many shows in their last season, they don't necessarily know it's their last season, so it just kind mm. of abruptly ends. And the whole but I feel like every episode is built toward that finale and it's gonna make the series finale even more satisfying. 
Well, the first couple episodes of the season were a little bit of a downer, I think largely because of the state of the relationship between um, Ron and Leslie. Yeah. But then once they, like, had the episode where they kind of reconciled that. That was a great episode. Yeah, it's just been, from that point on, it's just been amazing. It's been so good. And I really appreciated that episode, too, because I was worried that they were going to drag out the whole Leslie-Ron feud to the series finale as well as the whole um, question of what was going to be done with the lands. And the Mm -hmm. fact that they haven't dragged those out has actually been an enormous relief. Yeah. I also like, uh, um, I I was just watching the most recent episode just before we started this podcast, but, oh man, um, I love that that Gary is finally back to his real name (laughs) (laughs) for the first time. Like, yeah. I was just thinking about that, about how, like, you know, it started out as Jerry, but that wasn't his real name. And you find that out later, that his real name was Gary, but everyone just kept calling him Jerry. And then they refused to call him Gary once he told him his name was Gary. And and then he just went along with it. I know. And then it went from Jerry to Barry, wasn't it? Larry <laughs> and, and Terry. And, and then finally now sure. he's Gary, which is his real name. Yep. <laughs> I, I really liked the episode where Donna and Joe got married. I thought that was some of the best, some of the best work the show has done this season. It's been exciting, and yeah, like just thinking this last episode, man, I was just cracking up every time. They're just constant little like jokes and I scenes, know. you know, the <laughs> Scientology I thought was hilarious. <laughs> or um, I think it was last week's when Leslie said she's gonna make a cookbook called The Feminine Mesquite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I swear the writers must have so much fun coming up with this kind of stuff. Really bad. That wasn't last. That wasn't last episode. That was the one before. I mean, like um, last week's yeah, episode when they yeah got yeah because the one the one before the uh, the other one from this week I should say was uh, uh, the Johnny Karate special. Yeah. Which was also funny, largely because of the Jerry moments again. <laughs> they have Gary moments. <laughs> I love how he wanted to give, like, an impassioned speech, and he's like, I got something I wanted to say, and you hear the whole crowd of kids are like, oh. <laughs> you know, I love the show. I've never really been, uh, the, the treatment of that character is the only element I've never been able to buy into. I, I, I think it's a kind of humor I legitimately don't understand, is that level of cruelty to someone with that much sincerity. I think if he were, like, there have been moments where he's just kind of, he just shakes it off, whatever, okay. I think it would work better if it was in that in that way, but it just, there's an imbalance to it that has never worked for me. Ah, uh, see, that's always worked for me so well. I, I, I absolutely adored one of the episodes when, it was, it must have been like season two premiere or season three premiere where, like, you know, Leslie's like, we're back, and she's just like running through and like getting everybody, and she goes to jerry and he's like painting this beautiful portrait and she throws <laughs> and she it in just, the river yeah <laughs> i remember that <laughs> it's just i i always thought that was funny because it's such a contrast to the characters too because like you know leslie's like a character who cares so much about everybody yet just you know <laughs> complete cruelty towards jerry and of course on the other hand jerry's got besides the cruelty he gets from them it's almost like Carmactic, but on the other side, he's got like a wonderful family. <laughs> sure. His wife is gorgeous. It's like a model, and, and his children are all like, you know, very attentive and loving. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, so it's, it's, it's almost Carmactic that he's got this like other side, you know? It's almost like he has all this great stuff, and this is karma like, you know, giving him his one uppance for, you know, <laughs> having too much Sure. Dinner. Sure. I don't, I guess I feel like the portrait, the, the, Person I always think of, I don't know if this is totally legit, but what I always think of is, is I feel like that much mistreatment needs to be for someone who's a sad sack. And one character that really worked for me in that regard was Ted on Scrubs. I don't know if you ever watched that, but I always found his, that kind of material from him really funny. Hmm. But I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm, I've only kind of seen a few episodes. Which character is? He's the um. lawyer. Oh, and, and everything I, yeah, I in his know. life goes really long wrong. Anyway, I don't know, but it's not. But that's fine. Like by and large, I still love the series, and I love almost everything about it. So I'll be sad to see it go. So it looks like you know we we know that that uh, um uh Chris and Anne are coming back. Uh, they must be for the series finale. Yeah, 
It must be really focused on that, you know. I've been kind of waiting, like, when? Is, how are they going to bring them in? What's going to happen? And yeah, I imagine something incredibly sentimental, and I yeah. mean that in the best way possible. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad to see um I, with the number of people they had appearing in this uh, last episode. I'm glad to see they uh, included people like um Paul Rudd's. Coming back as Bobby Newport because yeah. he's so funny in that role. Yeah, he's such a ditz. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like you're not gonna fool me. That's the character from Toy Story. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, and great. here's what really threw me off during the Johnny Karate stuff was they kept having commercials that the show had made. That and was then hilarious. NBC would put these little logos on the bottom for the blacklist, and I'm like, "Whoa!" Like the line between reality and real world, or in the and the story world, is is kind of blurring for me here, and I found <laughs> it really jarring. I love the what was the one that um and they and they had a callback to it later that um the the company merger one with was it Exxon Chipotle and. <laughs> something else I can't remember. Oh, that sounds familiar. I don't remember. But they had this whole commercial about how these three companies merge, and the commercial ended, and it said, you know, it was like X X is something Potle, and it's like proud to, <laughs> proud to be one of America's eight remaining companies. <laughs> yeah, they do keep. I I always forget the show is in 2017, and then they'll drop like a little pop culture reference, like how Justin Bieber. No, Shia LaBeouf has found his calling making jewelry and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of fun with that, and I really enjoyed that. Oh uh, yeah, it's great. This is this is what uh, I mentioned it before that like uh, um what I I watch episodes and in episodes the characters are stuck in the situation where nobody wants to work on the show anymore. Nobody has any hopes of it anymore, <laughs> and they're stuck on it. And the only reason they're still doing it is because of a grudge between the guy that runs their network and another per network that wants to start up a show with an actor from that show. <laughs> and so they're all stuck in this just because of this one guy's grudge or something. Nobody wants to do anything. And I was saying, that's almost like perfect. I'd love to be in that situation as a writer because you could just do anything. Oh, sure. <laughs> you could, like this is the season where, you know, the, the, the hockey coach that gives wise sage advice to his students, you know, starts to fight off the robot apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> you could do anything and, and oh, yeah. get away oh, yeah. with it in that situation. So it's cool seeing Parks and Rec kind of do that in the sense of, uh, you know, it's in the future, so they're just throwing shit out there. And I seeing know. What works, and it's hilarious. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, so that, that pretty much covers most of our talking points for the week. Uh that's that's kind of all of our shared content shows. I was making a list here, so yeah, that 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 catches us up. Next week we'll be talking about uh, the spring schedule. I'll, I'll have a preview up this week, and next week we'll be discussing kind of what's coming up. So it's going to be exciting. Game of Thrones. Oh yes, uh, Community. <laughs> Yay! Uh, that's going to be interesting. I don't know how you watch your content, but. Community is going to be interesting for me. I'm hoping that Yahoo Screen gets like a Chromecast extension on their app soon. Uh -huh. Cause that's how I watch my streaming stuff. And I'm like, ah, I don't know how else I'm going to do it. You know? Okay, I've yeah. never used Yahoo Screen before. Um, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> but got to figure it out for community. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Daredevil. I, I got the app and I tried to open it. I couldn't figure out anything I was supposed to do. <laughs> They don't really have any content on there right now, you know? They just have kind of like, they'll have like old Saturday Night Live sketches or something. Yeah, they, it. there's really nothing on there. Yeah. So, that, so maybe they're hoping to use shows like Community as a launching point. They did so. that, and they also have, um, um, what's her name, uh, the news reporter, is it Meredith Vieira? That they oh. hired on that she, as like a doing news for them. So they have that oh, okay. as well. That's actually they they've actually done something kind of interesting with that. I don't know if you've uh, if you followed that, but um, do you know about Snapchat? Yeah, I've heard of it. I've never used it. Well, the way it works is it's you know it's kind of seen as like this privacy thing almost, and that you can send a picture, and then that picture once the person like checks it out, then it's like gone. 
And so the, the kind of idea is that kids like it because, you know, everything they do now is kind of like on their record, you know? You do anything and there's a record of it. And sure. it, it ties back to you. And the idea of Snapchat is just that you have something that doesn't have a permanent record. Okay. It's not like it's private or anything because you're sharing it with everybody you're sharing it with. But it's, so it's the same in that sense. But it's not going to, like, stick mm-hmm. around and haunt you three years later, you know? Like everything on Twitter? <laughs> like everything on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, but they've been doing some weird kind of experiments with it, and they've been trying some larger companies that have been playing around with it. And they started making um, little services as well that are kind of more like um, uh, like Vine almost, where you can have these really short video clips and they don't, like, go away. They don't, like, expire. But they're just kind of, like, short kind of things. And Yahoo has been using them um, to do, like, news stories. And okay. so the news stories are just short. You know, you get you get the information you need. They're not overdrawn out, you know. Uh-huh. So it's like a Vine video, but you get your news story in it. That's an interesting then, idea. And, yeah, and you can literally just swipe through a bunch of news stories. So, like, you could have a news story. It's like, oh, this is boring to swipe to the left and... The next one starts it immediately. Oh, uh-huh. okay. That's interesting. And so it's like a quick way to just kind of browse through news, you know, video news coverage. So it's kind of, yeah. Sorry, that's a little off topic for us. We don't really <laughs> talk about, you know, unscripted or news coverage and stuff. But I thought that was interesting. I've been seeing that. And it makes me think about what, you know, you know, the way that the industry is changing with streaming, you know, and, and yeah. how things are going to affect it. Seriously. But, I'll freely admit my perception of um, the me- the news media for about the past 10 years has largely been shaped by John Stewart. So I have a huge <laughs> amount of skepticism. John <laughs> Stewart is leaving the Daily Show. I yeah. know. Oh. I am so upset about this. It's uh, going to take me years to get over it. It really is. The big question is who's going to replace him now because, of course, Colbert is now going to be the host of... Uh, I know. Of the Late Show, and then on top of that, um, the one guy that everybody thought would be a perfect replacement for Stewart is now on HBO, and he's got a contract to through 2017, I think. But his show is awesome. I will say that. Just the clips that I've seen, I usually watch them. It's the, the, the long it's form he stuff is that he does. Where killing it on like, HBO. He's so good. Like, yeah. um, like when he deconstructs the Miss America pageants or explains Scottish independence. Like, he's amazing. <laughs> he's so funny and he's so informative. So I'm, I'm sad that he's not available for Daily Show, but he's doing such a good job on HBO. I want him to stay where he is. I think it works better for him, too, because when, when you're on something like HBO and you're not on, like, every night, you know, uh-huh. you just have more quality control. Yeah. And you can really nail things down and get, like, a really, you know, that that's how he can have these really perfectly nailed down, you know, commentaries. Yeah, right. like, he really gets into depth into one specific issue the way that Colbert Report and Daily Show have never really allowed for. And I know also that um, he said that HBO told him that since they don't have an ad service, he has complete freedom to go after corporations, which really opens up a lot of possibilities for him that I think yeah. even Stewart and Colbert. Yeah, that's really awesome, I think. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's funny to watch that. So. He's going to be on that um, until 2017, so everyone's kind of wondering what's who's going to take over I it know. now. You know? I know. Really I can't cope with it yet. I have to go through the grieving process of dealing with John Stewart leaving because, I mean, he's been, like, such an icon for me for so long that I just can't handle the thought of him leaving yet. Well, what's Craig more interesting... Kilborn doing these days? <laughs> <laughs> I that might be the, kind of weird uh, to take the Daily Show back to what it used to be. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I think the more in, the more interesting um, I, people I've seen come up as possibilities to host are the ones that have had nothing to do with the show so far, like uh, Amy Poehler. Oh, she'd be fun. Yeah, it's like, you know, you take somebody who's really good but that has nothing to do with the Daily Show now because immediately, of course, you know, you think like, oh, who's going to take over? And you start to think of all the different 
people that pop up on the Daily Show. You know? Right. But yeah. if you really think about it, John Stewart wasn't popping up on the Daily Show before he took it. No. Over. Yeah. yeah, he was brought in from the outside. He wasn't ever a correspondent or anything. Well, when Amy Poehler or someone like her, I think it could be a lot of fun because she's funny and intelligent, and she also has a particular voice. Like, I think she would have a lot to say. Right. Like she mm-hmm. would be really good at taking it and shaping it into, into something particular to her, the way John Stewart did. I agree. They, they need they need to find somebody work. who's funny, they have their own independent voice, and they're going to take the show in their own new direction. Yeah. Not just you know, and, and copy what John yeah, Stewart did. Yeah, it can't did. just be a rehash of what John Stewart did because it's such it's so particular to John Stewart. Right. And it would be our first significant um female led uh talk late night talk show. Which would be awesome. I think we're ready for that. I think I, we are. I, yeah. We've tried it we've we've tried it before. There've been a few, but they just they they were just kind of, you know, they kind of fizzled out. I think what sure. John Rivers had one, I think. Mm-hmm. Um I'm trying to remember who else. Was it Roseanne Barr that had one? I'm trying to remember, but there there were a few people that had them like back in the '90s and stuff, but they just didn't work out. It just wasn't the right, you know. It was it kind of came on as like came off as like a Me Too kind of situation, oh. or it was like like oh, you know, I could watch the Tonight Show that's established, or I could watch this Me Too show that you know has a female host, but that's pretty much the only difference or something, you know. <laughs> so it never really took off, but in this case, it would be somebody taking over a position that's already in place, you know? So it wouldn't be a me too. It would be a, yeah, me, or, you know? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. And I, so I think that, you know, it, whoever they get to put in there, as long as they do a good job, are it's pretty much, it's got it set up already, you know, ready to go. Yeah. Um, when I actually somewhat going back to Parks and Rec, because on the subject of Amy Polarism, there was that episode, I think it was last week, where they had that just big giant mess in regards to gender politics, which was hilarious. Oh, yeah. Because everybody's, <laughs> so, uh, there's some group that's taking some offense about the way you're just portraying gender or whatever, and it had lots of really funny lines where that uh, guy was like, <laughs> Let I would just like speak. if for once the issue of feminism could be led by men. <laughs> <laughs> the woman against feminism said, I actually agree with that. But, um, I just like that, was it? Let Ben speak. And he's all, he just spoke. Oh, I, I'm late. Sorry. I missed the bus. <laughs> yeah. The episode was so funny, but I thought there was, I wondered if maybe there was a bit of um, Amy Poehler shining through there in some of the, I think especially during that, um, when she was listing up the stupid questions that they were going to ask her as the candidate's wife. She yeah. Can give them really <laughs> responses. And it's like she's clearly funny and she clearly has things to say. So I yeah. think that would make her a really fun pick. Her or Tina Fey. Tina Fey is going to be too busy. She's got that new show on Netflix that's, oh, that's coming up. That's, that's going to be discussed next week. Um, and uh, she's also she's doing something else. I think too. I can't remember what it is. But she's she's got she's she's busy. She's got stuff going on. Um I think Amy Poehler does too. She's got something else in the works, but it's not as solidified as what Tina Fey is doing right now. Okay. So she'd still be like more flexible for a position like that. But yeah. I think somebody like that would be really good. Yeah. It would just be, you know, you you gotta kinda take in a different direction. You can't just have like a you know, John Stewart two point oh. You need, you know Especially because how could anyone ever live up to John Stewart? If you just come in and try to be John Stewart, you're you're yeah. gonna fail miserably. Yeah, they they need somebody with kind of a different angle. Definitely, I think so. This is uh, Ben, the Weekly Set, uh, the Television Enthusiast Podcast. Um, we do this podcast every week. We try to get up on Fridays. Sometimes we're not able to. Uh, last week I wasn't able to because. Uh, I had a, a power outage that affected my editing. So we ended up getting it up on uh, Monday, I believe. So, But I should be able to have this up on Friday, so you can hold me accountable to that. What? <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, I'll just sign off. Bye. 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 Good night. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to theweeklyset at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network.
Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage of all of your favorite shows. 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 Of all of your favorite shows.